Uh, welcome back, everyone, to the third evening of our four evening uh, little, little seminar. It's great to see all of you uh, back with us again today. This session is going to focus on continue the conversation that we've uh, started with Marianne's presentation in, in detail last night on the ethics of nuclear weapons. And Marianne gave us a broad just peace or what you might call an ethic of peace building approach, which reflects the church's overall contribution to the moral debate. But there's a narrower ethics of and law of war approach that has been key um, to, to bringing the normative perspectives into the nuclear debate. And that's what I wanted to address uh, we want to address today, especially the ethics debate. Um, and the UN Ban Treaty, for example, which goes into effect in a couple of weeks, is premised on the facts, fact that, uh, that nuclear weapons um, violate uh, the laws of war. So this is a, a central part of the debate. It's not, it's not sufficient, as Marianne noted yesterday, but it's central. And Annie will distribute uh, a handout so you don't have to take notes. And I'm just going to give a brief introduction to what uh, the church of my take on how the church has approached the ethics of war um, debate on nuclear weapons. Uh, so, Annie, we, if, if you distribute that handout to everybody, uh, then you can not waste time taking notes. Yes. Uh, in my view, if you ask me in two senses what the church's core position has been since Hiroshima, I would say that nuclear deterrence provides at best a precarious, dangerous piece of a sort and not a genuine piece. And the church has sought to delegitimize the nuclear status quo and insisted on the moral imperative of mutual verifiable nuclear disarmament as a long-term goal. Now, the first part of the ethics of war approach to nukes is to focus on the use of nuke, the morality of the use of nuclear weapons. And there are two use and bellow norms. The just war tradition has use ad bellum when the norms that, uh, that, that determine whether it is moral to go to war and then use in bellow norms, the norms that govern uh, the actual use of force during war. And the, the two use and bellow norms that are particularly relevant are proportionality and discrimination. Discrimination, thou shalt not directly intentionally target uh, civilian populations um, and proportionality that in targeting military targets, um, the collateral damage or, or expected collateral damage should not be disproportionate to any legitimate uh, military objective that is being pursued. So starting, the, the first question is, is the use of nuclear weapons morally acceptable? Um, in 1983, the US bishops in a very detailed pastoral, the peace pastoral, which we've mentioned, uh, they said a couple things about the use of nuclear weapons. First, following the Second Vatican Council, they condemned um, outright uh, the counterpopulation warfare or city busting. That's mutual assured destruction where we're targeting cities. Um, and that was one of the only moral condemnations of the Second Vatican Council was against counterpopulation warfare, whether by nukes or. <laughs> um, then the bishops looked at the question of first use. Is it moral to use nuclear weapons first to deter against non-nuclear attacks, such as the, the, the major concern was a conventional attack by the Soviet Union on Western Europe. Um, and there the bishops said that they opposed the first use of nuclear weapons. And it was based on a prudential judgment uh, about not wanting to break the nuclear taboo uh, that has developed since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and also the risk of escalation that could quickly become indiscriminate and disproportionate. Um, and then finally, the bishops addressed second use. You know, that you've been attacked by a nuclear weapon, can you respond in kind? And the bishops professed, said that they were profoundly skeptical about the moral acceptability of even the second use of nuclear weapons. And again, because they're concerned about the high risk of, of that second use becoming a general nuclear war that would be indiscriminate and disproportionate. 
Well, since then, the Holy See has been very clear that any use of nuclear weapons would be immoral and illegal. Then you have the question of deterrence, the deterrence ethic. Um, John Paul II, in an address to the United Nations in 1982, um, in a couple paragraphs, this was not a detailed assessment of the ethics of deterrence, said that uh, deterrence could be morally acceptable uh, in the interim, uh, as long as you were moving toward uh, progressive nuclear disarmament. Then the US Bishops Peace Pastoral elaborated in detail on that and developed some of their own criteria. And briefly, the Bishop said that there's a sole use criterion, that the only purpose of deterrence is to deter the use of nuclear weapons. You can't use deterrence to deter conventional attacks or biological or chemical weapons attacks. And you can't uh, use a de develop nuclear weapons with a war fighting capability. Second, they said that you could only have enough weapons that are sufficient to deter. It's a sufficiency criterion. And third, they said there's a disarmament criterion that deterrence has to be a step toward progressive disarmament. It can't be uh, the long-term basis for peace. Now, in the post-Cold War, the U.S. bishops have talked a lot about moving beyond deterrence. Um, and the Holy See, especially under Pope Francis, has said that uh, deterrence uh, and the possession, even the possession of nuclear weapons uh, is immoral. And there's a difference of opinion on whether the, the, the papal statements in recent years reflect a uh, in principled objection to uh, the threat of use of nuclear of deterrent of nuclear weapons or even the possession or whether it's simply a prudential judgment being made by the Pope that the conditions that the conditions laid out by the U.S. bishops and, and uh, Pope John Paul II uh, have not been met and therefore the current deterrents are not morally acceptable. And then finally is a non-nuclear disarmament ethic. Um, and the way I've, I've divided it up is I would say that the nuclear haves um, have a heavy moral burden to move toward nuclear disarmament and use the resulting peace dividend for development. The nuclear have-nots um, have a moral obligation to forego nuclear weapons. And both all, in all countries, the nuclear haves and the nuclear have-nots um, with a special burden on the haves have an obligation to prevent proliferation, negotiate verifiable and forceful disarmament treaties, and strengthen systems of cooperative security and take out their steps to build a positive peace that Marianne talked about last night. Um, so that's a very brief, and I'm sure some of you might not agree with that interpretation, but very, my very brief take on, on how the ethics of uh, the just war has been applied in the nuclear debate. Now with us to uh, this session, we have uh, two experts on the question. Uh, Drew Christensen, you've met. Uh, Drew and I have uh, been joined at the hip since 1983 when I took two courses from him at the Graduate Theological Union. Uh, he was uh, my boss at the Bishop's Conference and I was his boss at the Bishop's Conference and we've done a lot of academic work together uh, then and since then. So it's, it's uh, great to be able to work with Drew for so many years on this on this issue and other issues. Uh, professor Michael Desch is a professor of international relations at the University of Notre Dame. He's the founding director of the Notre Dame International Security Center. And before that, before he came to Notre Dame, he was the founding director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs at the George Bush School of Government and Public Services at Texas A&M University. Uh, and I understand Texas A&M is ranked ahead of Notre Dame now in the final rankings, which is curious at best. So <laughs> welcome, welcome to uh, Mike Desch for joining us. Glad to be here, Jerry. Uh, so let me begin um, with some, some questions for both of you. Uh, first, to some, morality is an uninvited guest of what should be uh, in some people's perspective, a hard-headed realist debate about the complex nuclear strategies and tactics necessary for national global security. To others, morality should be decisive, given the uniquely destructive nature of these weapons. 
What's your view about the role of morality in the nuclear debate? And maybe we can begin with, uh, with you, Mike. Uh, with me. Um, I know my role here is to be the skunk at the garden party um, and uh, uh, play the, uh, uh, you know, hard-headed uh, realist uh, straw man who will say that uh, morality is the uninvited guest um, at the uh, table for the discussion of uh, uh, nuclear strategy. Um, but I'm not going to uh, play that role uh, because I don't believe uh, that morality is irrelevant to the discussion. Uh, I don't believe it's irrelevant, first of all, in understanding uh, the evolution, uh, particularly of uh, American uh, nuclear strategy. Uh, I actually think moral considerations have been very important, although I think they've also been complicating uh, in a way um, that uh, advocates of a strictly moral approach to thinking about this topic, uh, you know, uh, might be uh, surprised about. Um, and secondly, as a practicing Catholic, and I'm 60 years old and I'm still practicing, uh, which uh, uh, just shows you, uh, I, I have a very flat uh, learning curve. Um, but I do feel uh, that myself in how I think about uh, the issues we're talking about tonight um, is uh, not disconnected uh, from an ethical obligation uh, as a human being, as a Catholic, and uh, as a uh, scholar uh, to uh, think through these issues. Um, I don't know how, how long you want me to uh, stay on the, uh, the soapbox about this, um, Jerry, um, you know, but I'd be happy to uh, go through, uh, you know, maybe I give Drew uh, a minute here while I catch my breath, but go, go through in particular uh, the argument uh, about, you know, how I think uh, the uh, ethical considerations associated with nu nuclear strategy have been important in the United States, but also um, how they've uh, led to some unintended consequences. Uh, but maybe I'll wait for that for my uh, next round, if, uh, if that's okay with you. Okay, sure. Uh, we'll come right back to you. Drew, what, what's, your, what's your sense on the overall role of morality in the debate? Well, I, th I think that uh, morality is really about uh, how we think of our actions as total human beings in a, in a context where we may have narrower kinds of concerns. Um, whether it's profit in some case, or uh, winning a war in another, um, or uh, uh, making a scientific discovery with that, which has various kinds of implications and uh, fallout from it. Uh, and so uh, what's, what's important is what, how, how does this impact the rest of life? And one of the reasons that, uh, that uh, realism is insufficient guide is that it has a very narrow basis for kind of understanding uh, what human reality is. It is simply power politics. It's real politique. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that in the, in the uh, 21st century, that's a 19th century uh, way of looking at things that we, we need to put behind us. Um, when, uh, uh, when, when the bishops published the pastoral in, in 1983, uh, and I was teaching at Berkeley, the scientists from Lawrence Livermore Labs, where the weapons were designed and tested and verified, uh, or, or plans were made for, for verification and so on, um, they came to the bishop asking for discussions of, of the pastoral. And uh, we had discussions between theologians and uh, social scientists and, and weapon scientists for four years. And uh, out of that, a number of them made consequential decisions about where they were going to go with, with, their, with their work and their lives. So uh, some decided that they would retire from weapons work altogether and just teach physics. And others shifted their work within the labs 
to just do verification and monitoring, or or it was possible in those days to move over to, to, to new programs in, in renewable energy. Um, uh, so there, there were a variety of kind of decisions that they made to bring together their, their sense for the human implications of, of nuclear weapons uh, and their actual work with, with that field. And I think that's kind of what, what the ethics provides is a way for us to kind of bring our, our own lives together uh, with, our, with our deepest values and a broader consideration of the world. And this is a very complicated world. Uh, the situation today is not the situation of, of the 1960s or even the 1980s with respect to nuclear weapons. We have uh, nine nuclear powers. Uh, only five are in, in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, which means that four are hanging out there doing whatever they want. And even those within the, 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 the treaty, the big the, the P5 from the UN, uh, haven't met their obligations on disarmament. Uh, they've used the, the treaty as a as a kind of fig leaf behind which to force other nations to deny themselves nuclear weapons where they went ahead advancing their own programs. Um, and uh, uh, in addition, uh, the most of the nuclear powers have plans to use nuclear weapons for non-deterrence purposes. Uh, the not the the uh, the uh, uh, nuclear uh, posture reviews in, in the U.S. have gone back and forth between uh, allowing that and not, but at, at present time, they allow using nuclear weapons for non, to, to, to respond to non-nuclear threats. And so that creates a much more unstable situation. The, the Russians, for instance, have a much broader understanding of deterrence, which means everything in which they have an interest um, is affected by policy. So nuclear weapons can refer to anything in their, their span of, of policy. Uh, so, so uh, it's a much more complicated world, and therefore, there's a much greater urgency to bring nuclear weapons under control today than there was even uh, 40, 50 years ago. Jerry, could I um, just make two, uh, two sure. points in response to uh, some of the things that uh, Drew has said? Drew, I'm a card-carrying realist, um, and I believe that uh, a realist view uh, of how the world operates is in fact uh, not uh, antithetical to uh, ethical considerations. Um, in fact, uh, I believe in nuclear deterrence as a theory of peace. And I believe that peace is a moral imperative. I believe that nuclear deterrence is a more reliable way uh, of creating uh, peace than uh, some of the uh, alternatives out there, at least the ones that I think uh, are realistically uh, feasible. Um, I promised to make uh, a uh, provocative statement about uh, the downsides of uh, ethical considerations in nuclear strategy. Um, in your vignette uh, about dealing with the uh, weapon scientists that uh, Lawrence Livermore um, is going to be my uh, my springboard for that. Uh, I think both, um, you know, on the civilian side, but also on the military side, just war theory, not so much Catholic just war theory, but of course, Holy Mother Church's view of uh, just war theory really is the underpinning uh, today of uh, you know how almost everybody thinks about uh, just war theory um, has been very important, and particularly the whole notion of uh, non-combatant immunity, uh, and I think that's been internalized by targeteers and by scientists. Now you know that's a good thing. Um, except that the approach um, that many people has, ha, have thought uh, is a, a better way to, uh, you know, avoid uh, combatants uh, in a nuclear exchange is to produ per pursue counterforce, uh, which um, is ironic because I think we both agree um, that a, uh, a counterforce doctrine 
uh, for nuclear weapons is likely to be uh, highly destabilizing. That's a, a pragmatic judgment, um, but you'll get a lot of people, including a lot of devout Catholics who are involved in the weapons enterprise, who will say, you're telling me um, that uh, non-combatant immunity is an important criteria of just war theory. Um, and I'm telling you that we're moving in a direction that reduces uh, combatant vulnerability. How can that be uh, immoral? It can be, uh, but what it suggests is the complicated element uh, of these uh, ethical um, and moral imperatives that, uh, that drive us. So be careful what you wish for sometimes. I think so. I, th I, th I think that uh, uh, there are people who have really dealt with these issues uh, from the government side that have changed their minds about them. And uh, they, they've changed them because the conditions have changed, what, what some people call the moral ecology has changed. So uh, particularly important in this country where are the, uh, the gang of four, George Schultz, Bill Perry, um, uh, Sam Nunn, and Henry Kissinger, who in 2005 uh, argued for abolition is the only, the only alternative now with respect to nuclear weapons. So these are all people who had a role in carrying out the Cold War and in conducting nuclear strategy. And uh, George Church is now 100, still working on this issue. And Bill Perry is an advanced stage and still working on the issue, very determined, as a Sam Nunn, that we move towards abolition because uh, in an age of uh, global terrorism and an age with multiple actors, uh, it's, you know, it's very difficult to keep a stable, uh, a stable nuclear uh, platform in the world. Uh, so so let, let me let me ask you, Drew, um, two things. I mean, you're absolutely right. The world has changed uh, dramatically uh, from the period of the Cold War. And I was telling Jerry, uh, we showed uh, a group of our students, the old uh, 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 Burdick uh, movie Failsafe last night. So we were in sort of high Cold War uh, mindset. We, we do live in a very complicated world today. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, and unfortunately, I think great power conflict um, is going to be back on the agenda, whether with Russia uh, or with China. Uh, on the other hand, we also live in a world uh, in which uh, during the Cold War, uh, the two major combatants had uh, somewhere north uh, of 70,000 nuclear warheads combined. Uh, today, the number that the United States and Russia have is below 10,000. Uh, and that includes weapons um, that are uh, in storage uh, or set to be um, you know, uh, deactivated. There are other nuclear powers, um, but they're not uh, major nuclear powers. And in fact, China, which is likely to be the great power rival of the United States, so far has not been investing in Cold War uh, level uh, uh, development uh, of its nuclear arsenal. So the idea that, you know, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists doomsday clock should be closer to midnight now than it was, you know, in 19, in October of 1962, um, you know, strikes me as um, not recognizing uh, how the world has changed. I'll tell you what really, uh, another thing though about the changing world that really makes me nervous is that in a way, um, this process uh, of drawdown and almost denuclearization that's taken place um, since the end of the Cold War um, is actually, if the United States has its way, and probably the same is true with Russia or China, is going to produce a world uh, in which the only people who have nuclear weapons are third-rate powers, um, and that the major powers are going to have non-nuclear systems that are going to have nuclear uh, capability in terms of effects, 
Um, but worse yet, because they're not nuclear weapons, uh, they're not going to be subject uh, to the same uh, constraints that nuclear weapons were during the Cold War. I'm scared stiff that we're moving to a world now where great power war is thinkable. And a big reason that it's thinkable is that nuclear weapons are in a way passe for the cutting edge military powers. Well, the nuclear weapons have, have not given an edge to uh, the nuclear powers, to the Russians in Afghanistan or ourselves in, in Iraq. But uh, I mean, I think when you claim that, that uh, deterrence has kept the peace, uh, the, the deterrence has also been the cause of, of uh, untold suffering and harm in the Middle East with our, our, our wars in, in, in Iraq, for instance, the unnecessary movement there out of, out, of, out of a false desire to, to prevent proliferation when, it, when proliferation had stopped and the UN had, had verified that. Uh, and it was untold suffering. And that was, and, and uh, there are uh, uh, the, the but we can't we can't blame that on uh, nuclear weapons. It was no, it's out of the, the, the desire to, to keep the monopoly prevent. on nuclear weapons. That's the no, problem. no, no. It would, but it was the desire to prevent uh, proliferation um, in Iraq, which, as you say, uh, was uh, you know based on a a series of wrongheaded assumptions in terms of. Uh, what Iraq was doing, and uh, but it, it was precisely the view that nuclear that the possession of nuclear weapons uh, by a regime, you know, like Saddam Hussein's, or today like the uh, mullahs in Iran, uh, that it was so unacceptable that we had to, on the basis of very weak evidence, uh, take steps militarily to ensure. Uh, even if there was only a 1% chance. So nuclear weapons have not kept the peace. That brought us into war and, to, and into, into no, extraordinary... Get it, get it. Trying to get Thank rid you. of nuclear weapons has gotten us into war. We didn't try to get rid of Soviet nuclear weapons or Chinese nuclear weapons, and we never went to war uh, with those two countries. More yeah. damage has been done uh, in terms of uh, the efforts to forcibly prevent uh, nuclear but that's proliferation. All on the mindset that nuclear weapons provide a certain kind of legitimacy within the international system for those great powers. Uh, no, I think it was, uh, you know, uh, fragile regimes that felt threatened um, and felt that they had no other way to. Uh, uh, protect themselves, but it. But again, during, look at look at poor Ukraine. New Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, and now uh, it's it's lost Crimea and it's lost the East to the Russians, who are a nuclear power. No, uh, no, but, but that's. But you'll get, and I'm not endorsing this argument. But Drew, the, there are plenty of people who, uh, including John Mearsheimer at the University of Chicago, who way back when said that Iran or Iran, Ukraine should keep its nuclear capability uh, because it was going to need it one day. Um, uh, Ukraine uh, denuclearized um, and uh, it's now in a very weak position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. That happened, the causal link was they got rid of their nuclear weapons in the 90s things went south beginning in 2008 uh, but, after they had gotten rid of their nuclear weapons. So we can't because, blame nuclear weapons for the that. US and the UK would not, would not come through on their commitments to respond if, if they came under threat from Russia. Should we have gone to war with Russia over uh, we could have done Ukraine? Lots of things. Uh, you know, uh, we could have done lots of things. Um, and that, but, 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 uh, we had made commitments uh, in the Budapest Memorandum, uh, three ways, Russia of that time, uh, uh, the US and the UK. And when the crisis came, the Western powers backed off. We Russia didn't, we didn't go to war with a, uh, a nuclear power. And I say, thank God. Well, Let you know, me uh... we have to go to, we, we've been doing lots of other things with Russia. Uh, we could, you know, we could have done the arming of, of, of Ukraine. There's lots of things. We, we, we have armed Ukraine. Okay. 
This is a really this is an important issue, but uh, let me let me try to get at some other issues in the remaining time we have left. Um, uh, um, one is one is the question of uh, in the relationship between development and deterrence. Uh, the Vatican is off from the very beginning is tied. Uh, nuclear disarmament to development and said that there's basically a guns and butter argument. Um, you know, as we heard last night in de great detail from the Nuclear Threat Initiative specialists, uh, the US and, and other nuclear powers are spending trillions of dollars in the next 30 years uh, on modernizing their nuclear uh, arsenals and basically replacing the, the arsenal that we had some version of the arsenal we had in the in in during the Cold War, at least in terms of the triad. What do you, Mike? Well, I'll start with you. What do you what do you think about the the modernization program that we're spending a lot? Are there, there are aspects of that that you uh, that you support? Other aspects you have problems with? And then how does how do you, how would you relate that the money we spend on nukes to uh, you know, the question of development, the way the, Vat the Vatican, the church has linked the two. Yeah, so th those are two separate, um, but uh, equally important questions. The, uh, uh, I think it started out being $900 billion. I think now it's like 1.2 trillion uh, over the next 30 years. Um, modernization program for the US nuclear enterprise. Uh, involves a, a lot of different things. By the way, um, it began uh, not under the Trump administration, but uh, under the Obama administration. Roughly, roughly speaking, and you know, we don't really have time to go through everything. Um, you know, I I think that anything that goes to uh, reliability um, and uh, uh, nuclear security. Um, is probably money well spent. I'm a little bit worried about some of the uh, weapons acquisition programs, which I think are continuing us on this road to developing uh, counterforce capability that we've been on, you know, since the uh, early 1960s. Um, and uh, I don't think, you know, even with the late Cold War legacy systems that the United States has, I don't think we need uh, more hard target kill capability than we already have, which is very, very substantial. The bigger question, though, is the uh, opportunity quest, uh, uh, question, or the uh, you know uh, pounding the uh, plowshare uh, the swords into plowshares argument. And I don't want to be in the position of saying 1.2 trillion dollars is not real money. On the other hand, uh, the nuclear weapons enterprise in DoD and in the Department of Energy constitutes uh, probably uh, 15 to 18 percent of what the United States spends on defense every year. Um, and just to put it in context, um, you know, if you want to save real money that you might direct um, to, uh, you know, more worthy undertakings, why are we talking about uh, cutting nuclear weapons? Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a uh, big fan of massive retaliation in part because he understood that uh, nuclear weapons were a lot cheaper than the alternative. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, if you're really interested in uh, you know, redirecting a large amount of money, uh, you would have to do it uh, from uh, US conventional and general purpose forces. That there's just not a lot to uh, take out of the, uh, the nuclear enterprise. And of course, the biggest part of uh, uh, the, what we pay for conventional forces is salary and benefits and health care. So, uh, you know, it's not uh, like you're going to find a lot of money that you can pull out of that that wouldn't. Um, you know, come out of people's hides. So uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to see more development aid, um, but I think 
uh, that cutting nuclear weapons uh, is not going to put a lot of money into, uh, you know, those coffers. Uh, Drew, uh, let me ask you about the, the Pope has said that the, the possession of nuclear weapons is morally unacceptable. And you're doing a book right now on, on the policy and pastoral implications of that. What does that mean for somebody in the nuclear military or members of Congress who are voting for the military budget every year, which includes uh, 18% for nuclear weapons, et cetera. Uh, what's the, what's the Im impact of that, or the import of that, uh, state, that statement that the possession of nuclear weapons is morally unacceptable? Let me first respond to the question of, of, uh, of uh, the cost of nuclear weapons and, and uh, funding development. Uh, I think that, that I agree with Mike. I don't think you can cut nuclear weapons uh, uh, in a way that's going to make a difference unless you can also cut conventional weapons. And so I think the provision of the nonproliferation treaty that calls for uh, the, to which the state parties are committed to, uh, to work for uh, nuclear disarmament in the context of general complete disarmament, which really is, is very ambitious, uh, uh, is, is, is realistic at this degree that it's, it understands that if you cut nuclear weapons, you're going to need more conventional weapons. So you need to think about controlling them both at once. And the savings, I think, are going to come when you talk about saving, doing both of those at once. I think there are savings. I, th I think a lot of people, like our friends from NTI and others, would, would say that, you know, uh, the missile arm could probably go without any problem that the submarine force is sufficient to provide ICBM coverage. I agree uh, completely. And I, th I, think, I think the other thing is, uh, from, from the point of view of someone who wants to uphold the fire break, uh, I, I think uh, making the, the uh, uh, weapons that are flexible, that can go from being you know, uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction to field weapons, is a bad idea, uh, and I, I wouldn't fund any of those those things either. So that's just a start on where that would come from. But I I think there can be savings made, but it means doing both conventional and nuclear together. I think um, uh, I think the the first thing is that uh, people have to understand that that uh, when they're in those positions, that they have that they're called to make a judgment of conscience. Um, and uh, uh, people ask me, well, does it mean they have to drop what they're doing right now? Uh, well, I think if their conscience says drop what you're doing now and find another way of life, yes, you know, you know, if that's what they find. I think we need to do more with our pastors, uh, our, 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 our spiritual directors need to do a lot more to be able to, and chaplains, to train people for conscientious objections and conscientious judgments in these situations. Uh, in 1968, as I said last night, the bishops already had said that the nuclear forces were a place to, to, uh, to think about selective conscientious objection. Uh, but, but I think uh, what's important to, to understand is that Pope Francis uh, puts things in a different way than our standard academic uh, uh, notions of, 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 of uh, military ethics have done or that the bishops peace pastoral did. Uh, he does not think in the categories of Kantian absolutes and uh, utilitarian judgments. On the other hand, uh, that's not the way, way he, he looks at things. I, I think uh, he has a way of, of trying to look at the big picture, for one thing, but also looks at the suffering of people in the world and so on, as you see in uh, Fratelli Tutti. And his approach is, is that of spiritual director. He wants people to seriously study these issues, uh, to pray over them, pray over them with, with their spiritual directors, pray over them with other colleagues in the field, and then make judgments about it, what course of action they should take. Uh, he expects that, that, that they should be responsible persons taking responsibility for the direction of history, from, from the positions that they have to influence history. And, uh, that's a different uh, approach than the approach he criticizes of moralism and legalism, but things are just black and right, white. 
He's asking for people to hear where they're being called to act now in this crisis, uh, the crisis of the new nuclear age, as, as, some, as the people of, who edit Daedalus called it last summer, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, to take responsibility and do it with others to bring about a change in the course of history. That's what he's doing. Uh, Mike, we've gone over a little bit on our plenary, but uh, last word? Yeah, I think the uh, situation we're in, particularly on the ethical and moral issues uh, associated with, uh, with nuclear deterrence, ha has always been very complex. Um, but I, I think it's even uh, more complex now. Um, because uh, what if it is in case, or in, in fact the case, um, that nuclear weapons uh, were the primary cause of the long peace, of the fact that um, we didn't fight World War III in a century in which two world wars uh, killed in excess of a uh, hundred million people. Um, and that was precisely um, the sort of Damocles um, hanging over our head that uh, prevented uh, many of the uh, things that uh, the long history uh, of Catholic and Christian just war theory uh, set out to, uh, to achieve. Um, and I don't think that uh, disarmament, uh, particularly nuclear disarmament, uh, cuts to the, the, the core of the real paradox um, that the 21st century uh, presents us uh, with uh, this particular issue. Um, that, uh, you know, yes, uh, you know, deterrence creates only a piece of a sort and we should aspire to a lot more. Uh, on the other hand, for 2000 years at least uh, of human history, we, we'd have been very happy with a piece of a sort uh, at a time in which uh, any piece uh, was uh, very, very scarce. Um, and so uh, I think um, that uh, the moral issues are much more difficult now because of that than the policy issues. The policy issues in my judgment are quite clear. Nuclear weapons were mostly a stabilizing factor and oh, by the way, they're going away. Um, and they're going away is not uh, something that we should regard as an unalloyed good uh, because there are a lot worse things coming behind it in my judgment. Okay, well, I, I lied. That's not the last word, but it's the last word in the plenary from the two of you. Um, <laughs> thank you both for that uh, vigorous and energetic uh, conversation. Um, we're going to break into small groups now for a little more, about 15 minutes. Um, and so we'll be able to continue the conversation with, uh, with Mike and Drew and, and all of you uh, in a smaller format. So we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll be back in about around 8.30. And now we turn it over to Mary Ann. Thank you, George. We're now turning to our part of the program where we ask, can the church make a difference? Can churches make a difference? And uh, we have some wonderful speakers here tonight who are going to tell us about um, two different aspects of the, of the church and, and their work in it. Uh, I'll offer some framing uh, remarks and then we'll turn and ask each of them to introduce themselves and then we'll have a, a bit of a conversation where we can uh, ask them some questions about their work. But just to give an overview, and, and some of this is in the article that Annie was kind enough to send out to you, you know, one of the things that I uh, argue is that religious actors bring three I's, the letter I, to international affairs. Uh, we bring institutions, we bring ideas, and we bring imagination. And so we just heard in the wonderful uh, discussion and dialogue between Drew and, and Mike, uh, the discussion of the church's ideas about deterrence and, and just war tradition. And, uh, and that was an example of the ideas that the church can bring to bear. 
But we'll be making that a more fulsome discussion by also talking about what institutions religious actors can bring to the discussion of, of nuclear weapons and uh, policies on nuclear weapons, as well as that uh, moral imagination. And it's really important at this time, as we said, as a sense of urgency right now, with the nuclear taboo kind of waning and being undermined in many ways, for uh, religious actors, uh, norms are us. This is what we what religious actors do. This is their their home court advantage is in uh, formation of norms, in, in in strengthening of norms, in promulgation of norms. So if there's a time uh, in history when the nuclear taboo is being undermined or eroded. This would be a real moment for religious actors to step up to the plate and be able to offer what is their area of competency to that to that normative agenda. We've already heard uh, in discussions uh, from, from last night and the previous nights about uh, times in which religious actors have played um, some key roles uh, in nuclear weapons. So whether it was Pope St. John the 23rd, who intervened and helped to de-escalate the Cuban Missile Crisis, doing in some ways what many feared uh, when the first uh, Catholic president was elected in the United States and they feared that he would uh, turn to the Pope for answers to policy issues. And then in the uh, this height of this new, uh, Cold War crisis, uh, he, uh, John Kennedy did turn to the Pope uh, and ask uh, for some intercession and some help. But, in fairness uh, to the church versus uh, the church and state debates, he, the Pope was certainly not the only actor that he turned to in that crisis to try to help de-escalate and, and pass uh, communications and messages back and forth. Uh, shortly after that was when Pachamantera's Peace on Earth was written in 1963. Uh, and uh, so that would be an example of, of the church's promulgation, both of ideas and of imagination of a different type, a more robust, more just peace uh, that the, uh, that the church was calling us to. Now, the, uh, in terms of demographics of, of religious actors, the kind of low point, as we would expect, was the mid 20th century. Uh, at a time when you had really the expansion of communist regimes that were uh, that were working very hard to, to undermine and persecute uh, religion, um, as well as some other regimes that were uh, had a, a, a had a more antagonistic relationship with religion, and as we saw the expansion of democratization towards the end of the 20th century, was really a rebirth uh, of religious organizations in many places. Uh, this, the, the, the quote of Mark Twain, uh, my death has been uh, prematurely uh, dictated you know, or, or, or directed was really the case. We found that the church wasn't dead in many uh, and religious actors were not really dead in many of these areas that they had been experiencing intense persecution. So in terms of um, empirical evidence, we know that 85% of the people on the planet self identify themselves as being religious or spiritual uh, people. And it's not surprising that most that do not identify themselves that way, uh, most of the, those folks live in, in one country, in China, uh, which again, you know, is not culturally uh, 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 surprising. So you have this kind of a robust reemergence of, of religious actors and uh, religious identification. So it's a lane to, uh, uh, to uh, operate for both policy and for imagination and ideas that was uh, perhaps more blocked in, period, in previous periods of world history. Um, that said, uh, in terms of all the major world religions, the Catholic Church has some unique uh, uh, organizational aspects and demographic aspects that give it some uh, abilities, some capacities uh, to engage on these nuclear weapons issues that some of the other religious actors don't have. So while there are many wonderful religious actors like the Quakers, the uh, Friends uh, Committee on National Legislation here in the United States or Buddhist organizations like Soka Gakkai, many different religious actors have been engaged in, in trying to uh, increase dis nuclear disarmament and, and uh, decrease the role of nuclear weapons in policy, uh, many of them don't have the, the reach or the capacity that the Catholic Church has. Um, most religious actors never left the cradle uh, where they were born, that the, their primary presence is still in those uh, regions where the, where the religion began. And Christianity, uh, according to Pew data, is the only uh, religious actor that is spread very evenly in different bands throughout all regions, geographic regions of the world. And the Catholic church uh, that is true of as well, 
the Catholic Church has presence really in all uh, of the um, of the countries of the world today, even the hermit kingdom of North Korea, uh, and uh, even in places like Iran, even in Saudi Arabia that has a state mandated religion. There are over a million Catholics in 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 Saudi Arabia. So. The, the Catholic Church has this presence, it's not a national church, uh, that is more equally distributed and more widely distributed and dispersed around the world in both nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states. Uh, it also has uh, a huge and very vast array of, of civil uh, society institutions. Uh, so from universities like it, that are represented here in our discussions here tonight, uh, parishes, schools, religious orders, learned societies, charities, hospitals, uh, Catholic peace organizations and networks like the Catholic Peace Building Network that's coordinating our discussions here today. So very rich uh, and varied uh, wide and deep institutional networks. But a another difference between some other religious actors is that the Catholic Church also is has this state-based institutional lane and has the world's uh, oldest diplomatic corps predating the existence of the sovereign state and has diplomatic relations with 183 sovereign states, as well as diplomatic presence at intergovernmental organizations such as the United Nations. So in this way, the church is able to work uh, very different uh, institutional lanes, is able to have very deep networks with civil society, but also have uh, direct relations uh, uh, with sovereign states and, uh, and in, with uh, uh, direct discussions and negotiations with sovereign states. And it's able to, in that way to be a forum, to be that kind of bridge builder that brings those worlds together. And that's really what we saw in the, in the church's activism uh, on the, the treaty to, to prohibit nuclear weapons is trying to bring all three of those eyes, the institutions, the ideas, and the imagination together. You know, Pope Francis has been arguing that we need to have a different and deeper type of moral imagination that allows us to imagine different and deeper relationships, uh, even with folks that had pre previously be considered our enemies. So he's uh, re uh, routinely saying that we need to uh, think of nuclear weapons as being an obstacle to building and imagining deeper and better relationships for a more positive peace. But they've also been activating those other, uh, those other lanes. So using the institutional networks of the Holy See at, the Gene at Geneva and at the United Nations and using their relationships with sovereign states and many Catholic countries were both the leaders uh, of the uh, non-proliferation treaty uh, and of the test ban treaty, many Catholic countries led in, the, in, those, uh, in those policy discussions and getting those treaties, as well as in the more uh, recent ban treaty that will be coming uh, on, on board uh, January 22nd. So, so this is a way in which uh, religious actors are able to play a part in what I call resurrection politics taking issues that were previously kind of dead on arrival or thought to be uh, a non-starter cause in policy making circles and are really able to, to help flip, uh, flip that. Not alone, uh, religious actors are, work very closely with civil society actors, uh, but they've been able to successfully play this type of resurrection politics roles, whether it was in, in the landmine treaty, whether it was a Jubilee debt campaign or more, most recently, in the, uh, in the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. And it follows a, a, a pattern, a deliberate pattern that I describe in uh, the, the book I'm writing now on God in the Bam, that you first see this diverse coalition of civil society actors and like-minded countries coming together. And that coalition includes doctors, scientists, scholars, healthcare providers, as well as religious actors. Um, and that coalition is able to successfully shine a light on the human face of a problem that had previously only been considered from maybe more narrow technical uh, 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 perspectives. And they're able to kind of bring a more fulsome human face to that uh, by sharing the stories of the world of the impact of these problems on the world's most vulnerable, uh, on victims and shaming and naming perpetrators and really being able to open up space the professionals, the doctors, uh, scientists, and scholars can, can validate the narrative with facts and figures, but the religious actors can help uh, really remind us of our moral obligations and open space uh, for, for those uh, uh, discussions to be considered in a different way, not just as kind of a narrow technical discussion. And together, 
of these uh, have been able to really change, to delegitimize the status quo and, and, and open up room for new norms to grow, take root, and, and perhaps even change policy. So um, there, th those are the ways in which uh, we can see a little framework of how religious actors ha have been uh, active in international politics and particularly uh, with regard to nuclear weapons. But now we're going to have the chance to have this wonderful discussion with folks who've been doing this uh, with different organizations. And so I'd ask uh, for each of them to introduce themselves and as we've uh, done with our other introductions to not only tell us you know, who you are and what your organization is, but also how did you get interested in these is issues and how, how uh, either as a young person or uh, at what point did you become more engaged in these issues? So uh, Lucas, do you wanna start us out? Uh, who, who are you and how did you get involved with this issue? Sure, happy to Marianne, um, thank you. And um, thanks to uh, Catholic Peace Building Network and Notre Dame and all, all the other friends and partners for inviting us to the uh, conversation today. Um, so uh, yeah, in brief, um, in my professional career, I um, uh, have worked in public policy and worked uh, with politicians, uh, having studied political science and international studies. Um, but uh, increasingly, um, I was being made more aware that I think the the rudimentary problems facing humanity are, are spiritual. Uh, the, the enmity in the, in the human heart between uh, us and, and our creator. And, and that led me further into, um, into uh, Christian ministry, it led me to become uh, an Anglican priest, uh, served in a parish context and so on, but I always wanted to work in this intersection of public policy and, um, and advancing uh, the gospel. Um, and uh, that equation uh, led me more and more to uh, study Catholic social thought. Uh, and in brief, that led me to become Catholic. Uh, so here I am uh, today uh, doing so. And in, uh, on this issue, particularly when I, you know, when I was going through college, uh, this was um, the, the time of uh, on the heels of the, the Reagan era. And, uh, and the rise of Mikhail Gorbachev and uh, Glasnost and Perestroika. And so, and you know, we were all very um, uh, galvanized. I think all Americans were galvanized by um, Ronald Reagan's uh, you know, declaration in, in his uh, 1985 State of the Union address where he said, you know, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And there was just a resounding yes um, throughout, throughout America across the aisle uh, towards that, and the, the, the idea of the, the possibilities, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of limitless, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing some good progress towards those ends, and uh, I, I kind of long for those types of days to return. We, we seem like we're, you know, by, by, by no means was it perfect then, um, but we uh, have much uh, ground to uh, in that regard, so um, I, I think, yeah, I wish to continue to work in that, that intersection uh, because ultimately I've discovered the, that uh, many of the policy solutions have been formulated. But as uh, the Catholic Church and Pope Francis most recently and uh, on his apostolic visit to Hiroshima and Nagasaki said that uh, we're lacking trust, that, that, that trust is what needs to be restored. And that ultimately, again, is a relational and uh, in the most rudimentary terms, a, a, a spiritual reality. Well, thank you, Lucas, and a, a, a great opportunity for students to think about career paths. We heard last night about career paths with uh, secular organizations that work uh, on nuclear weapons issues, but also there are career paths within religious organizations to, to work on these issues, as, as, as Lucas said, to be at that intersection of your faith and policy issues. Uh, Professor Hero, can you introduce yourself and tell us how you got involved in or interested in these issues, Hero? Yes. Thank you, Marianne, um, <clears throat> and thank you, everyone, uh, organizer, um, uh, for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Um, so um, I uh, only got involved in the nuclear um, weapons issue very recently, and I, I became Catholic. I was um, baptized. Um, I, I had 10 years of Jesuit education. I became Catholic along the way. But um, like many other um, Japanese um, uh, 
of my generation, um, I was not that particularly interested in uh, nuclear weapons or even Hiroshima and Nagasaki as I grew up. And um, just a few years ago, um, I think five years ago, I think four years ago, I um, developed a project that um, included Nagasaki as a research site. And I visited Nagasaki. I had visited Nagasaki a couple of times before. Um, and, um, and I was aware of Catholic being, um, Catholic Church being very um, important in the history of Nagasaki, etc. But I didn't really intend to um, study uh, nuclear weapons or nuclear disarmament or nuclear anti-nuclear activism. But when I studied uh, this project in Nagasaki, I met a whole range of people who were so committed to this issue and peace more generally, um, Catholics and non-Catholics, and they really converted me. Um, and, and I became really um, actively involved in their activism and and I also gradually um, became part of uh, the Catholic Church's local efforts, local and national and international efforts, uh, um, to to promote a vision of a world without nuclear weapons through the church in Nagasaki. And then um, and also along the way, I became involved in in a peace and justice committee. Um, of uh, my parish, parish um, here in Evanston, and um, um, this this parish happens to be um, already have done lots of work in this area, and um, when I became involved, the, this committee was uh, um, organizing uh, local and religious um, groups um, to to uh, um, uh, try to persuade the Evanston. Um, city council to to pass a resolution to call on the federal government to support the nuclear ban treaty, and and that effort was part of the um, probably you have heard of this that brick uh, back from brick from from the brink um, campaign um, in this country, uh, working with uh, working on various uh, municipal um, governments. And um, um, and to pass a resolu similar resolu resolution, and um, so I am part of the, this group in Evanston. Uh, just not not just Catholic, but also other um, you know the, um, Christian and also Jewish groups um, to work with the the, the uh, Illinois State uh, Assembly as well as the Chicago uh, City Council. And we are hoping we were hoping to pass um, and get get similar resolutions passed at those uh, um, um, fora um, before the COVID uh, began. So now the our activism is kind of stalled, but still uh, we are in conversation and uh, um, thinking about the next steps as the new administration comes it come, it comes in. And, and also along the way, I met uh, Father Drew Christensen um, at the conference, and he introduced me to this wonderful group of people, um, Jerry, George, and Marianne, and, and Annie, and, and also Lucas. And uh, so since uh, last summer, uh, we've been doing organizing lots of things um, involving the Catholic Church in Japan, particularly in Nagasaki. And um, uh, for, for the for the uh, um, commemoration commemoration of the the seventy fifth anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, so um, just to to um, you know summarize um, has something to do with um, my Jesuit education I think um, and and um, but also the connections and um, um, the that education has afforded me um, and that. Um, was kind of activated, reactivated recently uh, through the intervention of um, uh, deep, deeply committed peace activists, activists in Nagasaki. So I think uh, it's personal, a wonderful so. selection. Thank you, both of you, for those comments. But a wonderful selection of, of the two of you to, to represent uh, different voices of, of activism in the church on these issues. Uh, when you think of nuclear weapons, and when we say the Catholic Church is not a national church, this is an example of that. Here you have a representative from the United States, the country that developed and used nuclear weapons, 
uh, atomic weapons at that time against Japan, uh, uh, represented here as well, uh, enemies in, in World War II. And yet here we have very concrete example of, of, of reconciliation and being able to move forward to a much more sustainable and just peace, a very different type of relationship than existed 75 years ago. Uh, even though both countries today have, have different approaches to nuclear weapons, the church is active in different ways in those countries. Lucas, can you tell us a bit more about your work with the USCCB, the US Can yeah. uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops? Uh, uh, on, on nuclear weapons and disarmament and arms control issues. Sure, perhaps like, uh, like some of the activities we've been engaged in along those lines. Okay, yeah, yes. sure. Um, yeah, so beyond just how I've kind of got come to be engaged in this, this issue, um, as uh, my, my role is director for the Office of International Justice and Peace, which uh, our, our office, uh, and small staff helps um, staff the committee uh, the Bishop's Committee of um, International Justice and Peace. Um, so uh, the, this committee of bishops are responsible for uh, monitoring uh, any number of um, international uh, issues as it pertains to justice and peace uh, or humanitarian affairs um, and, and decide uh, when and how to um, engage in those uh, issues. Uh, be it to offer um, pastoral uh, encouragement and support to uh, the church or to those peoples in those regions, to offering you know, uh, moral uh, guidance or clarification where possible on behalf of the U.S. church, or uh, trying to speak into uh, U.S. policy uh, deliberation considerations. So uh, never a dull day in our office. Um, sure, so I'm happy to take a few minutes, uh, Marianne, to kind of uh, offer some things of where and how the U.S. Conference of uh, Catholic Bishops have engaged in this issue. Um, I know uh, you've already been given some some broader context around you know the development of the Catholic Church's in, uh, engagement on this this issue as well as U.S. bishops. So some of the particular things around that um, over the decades, the, the bishops have continued to exercise um, leadership regarding. Um, various elements of U.S. nuclear um, policy. Like in the late 80s, they raised uh, moral questions regarding missile defense initiatives. Uh, bishops urged uh, our nation uh, to meet its disarmament obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or the NPT. Um, they testified before Congress, um, in, in, for example, in support of then the, the SALT II Treaty between the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, U.S. bishops have supported the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty between Russia and the U.S. In, in the early 90s. In the late 90s, they supported the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, in 2002, um, they welcomed the, the Moscow Treaty as a, as a pov positive uh, step, um, but still calling for yet more to, to be done. Um, uh, in the 2000s, um, the U.S. bishops uh, opposed um, federal funding uh, for um, uh, the, the robust nuclear uh, earth penetrator and the reliable uh, replacement warhead and uh, new nuclear weapons. So as the you know, annual uh, uh, appropriations process to the Congress are, are looking at these different types of programs, uh, they had the wherewithal to try to speak into some of those uh, concerns and considerations. Um, they weighed in with uh, President Obama on his uh, nuclear posture review to try to narrow the purpose of nuclear arsenal solely for uh, deterring nuclear uh, attack. Um, they made major effort to offer vigorous support for the Senate ratification of the New START Treaty in 2010, which uh, is going to expire here on February 5th in a, a very few short days. And uh, so we we're hoping that um, the U.S. And, and Russia will be able to uh, salvage that uh, uh, last remaining treaty between our two nations that offer critical um, accountability uh, towards our, our nuclear arsenals and, and reductions therein. Um, um, the, the U.S. bishops uh, supported the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action um, that between the U.S. and, uh, and I Iran. Um, they, um, they uh, participate in, a, sometimes they get invited to participate in high level symposiums um, to, you know, again, try to offer moral, moral voice and clarity. 
Uh, for example, uh, the De deterrent symposium of July 2009 at the U.S. Strategic Command uh, turned to, to the U.S. bishops to um, offer reflections. And again, I think given how the bishops um, put tremendous energy, uh, certainly in like the most notably the 1983 pastoral, the challenge of peace, which has already been mentioned, um, it got U.S. policymakers attention and national attention. There's a whole whole book uh, called the, the Bishops and the Bomb. I don't have my copy to, to hold up as a um, uh, visual aid, um, you know, documenting how uh, that all came about and and chronicled uh, that that time within the, the U.S. Church. Um, I also want to just mention uh, in terms of some other activities that we've done. Um, again, more recently, and again, these are just kind of sampling, but I just want to offer these sort of high watermarks, I think, for some of our, our uh, activities and advocacy around um, disarmament. Um, uh, this, this this whole effort to move beyond deterrence was reinforced uh, in a statement between the U.S. and European bishops in 2017 um, called the entitled Nuclear Disarmament, Seeking Human Security. In 2018, the bishops um, urged the U.S. to remain a party uh, to the JCPOA. Um, we uh, expressed concern with the U.S. withdrawal from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF, in 2019. Um, the, uh, the Committee uh, on International Justice and Peace expressly uh, uh, later that year, uh, again, urged both the administration and the Congress to support extension, new start, um, and then uh, and have issued and then uh, we issued a statement around Pope uh, Francis's visit to Japan, um, and uh, as as Hiro was was mentioning, uh, you know, just uh, this past summer, uh, really did a lovely uh, collaboration between uh, Bishop um, David Malloy, the chairman of our our committee, uh, along with his counterpart in Japan, to um, you know to uh, soberly. Uh, re recall and recount um, the atrocities uh, that uh, befell our, our world and, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki expressly, um, and to renew our call uh, towards uh, you know, disarmament and ultimate um, abolition. So uh, the work continues. And again, that's, those are just kind of a sampling of some of the things we've, we've, we've done on, on that level. Uh, we also try to engage in advocacy in, in, in forums like this. Uh, education tools to lay Catholics, uh, ways to get involved or write your member of Congress or something uh, and, and tools uh, like that are always um, in, in the works. Uh, so that that's, uh, gives you kind of a, a survey of uh, some of the type of activities that the U.S. bishops have done and, and how they uh, go about engaging in, in these important issues. Thank you, Lucas, and thank you for all your efforts in these areas. Uh, Hiro, I wonder if you'd give us uh, some more details about the work of the Japanese church in this area. I think you may be, you may be muted, Hiro. Kenny, do you need sorry. to unmute here? Sorry oh, about that. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so I'd like to quickly um, um, go through uh, the, the, the kind of trajectory of uh, Catholic thoughts um, and on the atomic bombs in Japan and nuclear disarmament a little bit more generally. And I'd like to introduce some of the key figures. And so the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki have have had a, a quite a bit of impact on the Catholic communities in those two cities. And as you probably know, um, the, uh, in Hiroshima, uh, Pedro Arupe, a Jesuit um, um, uh, who was based in uh, this uh, um, sort of novitiate um, in, in the suburbs of Hiroshima, um, opened the novitiate to, uh, to uh, victims of, uh, of the bombing. and. Uh, he, he had some medical training. He had had some medical training, so he was able to to um, to organize a, a rescue operation. And this picture is quite well known. Uh, this is from a Jesuit uh, website, and um, um, this picture itself has had uh, quite a bit of impact on lots of uh, Jesuits. And he um, became um, superior um, general, uh, father general, um, 
um, later um, and uh, had a very transformative um, impact on the Society of Jesus. But also in 1950, he toured the world and um, really served as a witness to the horrors of uh, the bombing. And in Nagasaki, um, the, the largest cathedral, uh, Wurkam Cathedral, was completely destroyed and um, 8,600 8, um, 8, parishioners uh, died that year as a result of uh, um, as a bombing. And, um, but curiously, um, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, the church um, for, for some time was silent on the bombings. I mean, um, uh, Father Arupe was speaking on, on the bombing and the horrors of Hiroshima and uh, um, joined the many uh, thinkers at the time um, uh, talking about the, the um, um, science and, um, and the con un un uncontrollable nature of science, etc. But um, um, in, in Nagasaki, this, this figure, Dr. Nagai, um, Catholic um, medical doctor, became the, um, really the main voice. Um, and, 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 and then he basically said, um, in, uh, as part of a eulogy, that seems to have justified the bombing as a way to bring peace to Japan and the world. And so he provided this uh, thesis, later known as Divine Providence thesis, that atomic bombing was a divine providence. So uh, this became a very influential um, uh, framework for Nagasaki Catholics and pro probably elsewhere in Japan. And, um, and that seems to have an effect of uh, silencing um, Catholics' voice um, about uh, 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 nuclear weapons. Um, and that, that, that situation continued until um, 1981 when uh, Pope John Paul, uh, uh, Pope John Paul II uh, visited Hiroshima and Nagasaki and um, 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 made really powerful speeches um, condemning uh, war and uh, atomic bombings. Um, and this really triggered uh, um, a new, uh, ushered in a new era for Catholics in Nagasaki, and they became more involved in peace activism. And, and then, um, of course, uh, as uh, Lucas pointed out last uh, two years ago, um, Pope Francis visited Nagasaki and Hiroshima and, and uh, made, um, gave uh, even more powerful um, speeches um, denouncing the, even the position of nuclear weapons and, 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 and the impact of uh, these visits, um, papal visits, um, go, went really well beyond the, the Catholic community. Catholic community in Japan is very small and Catholic Church is a minority and they just organization. But the uh, impact of these uh, two popes' visit has been really um, impact, I mean, like, great. And, um, um, and so that's just interesting um, dynam dynamism um, operating, uh, emanating from the church. Um, and in terms of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of Japan, um, the, the Catholic Bishops' Conference had was long silent um, on the issue of peace, um, but after the, the Pope uh, Pope's first visit to Japan, um, the the Catholic conference, uh, Bishops' Conference started um, talking about peace more openly, and but initially um, on the issue of the the, the Church's war responsibility, and um, and there was a um, important document issued in 1995, basically um, admitting the church's complicitness and involvement and in, 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 in Japan's war effort. Um, and albeit in somewhat vague, um, unspecified fashion. And this issue, I mean, I'm kind of um, I'm jumping forward, but this issue, the question and the, 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 the kind of uh, work the church did during the war um, is still haunting the church's uh, um, legitimacy um, in in um, um, get, getting and uh, sort of getting involved in uh, uh, debate about uh, um, atomic bombings and nuclear weapons, and um, every um, um, 
10 years, um, the, the church has issued a strong statement and uh, the two statements in, the, um, in 2005 and 2015 really f focused on nonviolence, uh, denouncing war and weapons. And then uh, more recently at the anniversary of the 75th anniversary of the bombings, um, the Catholic bishops issued um, another um, statement um, in which uh, the, this, this call for the abolition of nuclear weapon was explicitly mentioned. Um, and um, citing uh, uh, the Pope's recent visit. And um, the current president um, of the Bishop's Conference, uh, Archbishop Joseph Mitsuaki Takami of Nagasaki, um, is an uh, atomic bomb survivor, the first atomic bomb survivor bishop, and um, openly, um, um, and, and probably the last. And, and he's been um, a kind of transformational uh, figure um, to some extent within the church, and he's been quite outspoken about this issue, as well as the issue of nuclear energy. And so the, the, under his leadership, the Catholic Bishops' Conference has uh, um, made clear its stance against both nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. And um, um, so he... Um, um, his um, um, really big statement uh, really focuses on the importance of reconciliation, the unresolved issue of reconciliation between the U.S. and Jap Japan, and U.S. and Japanese churches, and and um, perhaps uh, um, um, we may be able to work something um, out. Um, in terms of a more substantive dialogue between the bishops between in, in Japan and the United States on the issue of nuclear weapons. Thank you, Hiro. We are almost out of time to go to breakout uh, sessions. Uh, both of you have already um, discussed some of the challenges in your work, uh, Lucas, in talking about some of the times the bishops uh, have not been successful and, or, and other nuclear advocates have not been successful. And, and Hiro, in, in talking about the challenges the church faces in terms of uh, how to understand its, its role in, 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 in World War II, et cetera. But I wonder in our last maybe two minutes that we have left before breakout, if each of you can uh, tell us what gives you hope. Uh, so maybe one minute each uh, on what gives you hope going forward or what you see as some of the positive roles the church can play in these issues going forward. So uh, Lucas, you wanna start us out? What, uh, what do you see as the positives sure. of the hope? Um, you know, one very practically is uh, it, it is just kind of you know the, the one at a time when you you meet somebody you you talk to somebody and they get it and they say this is this is really important uh, I mean just having a, our, our friend uh, uh, Peter Metz here uh, with us today um, put you on the spot Peter but you know he, here's a gentleman who led a full career and he just started learning about this issue and and this is his issue. And he, so he's signing up for everything he can, he can get. And, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of first in line at, at our conferences and the last to leave. And, and, you know, I, I think that's how our Lord, um, measures, uh, uh success. Um, and then the, the other piece I think is just in terms of, um, is really thinking theologically and spiritually that, um, if we only look at this, um, in terms of public policy, yes, we can get discouraged and despondent. Um, but to remember that the kingdom of God um, is a success and it has triumphed. It, triumphed, it has triumphed. Um, it is triumphing now as we live our vocations and will do so into the future. And that can give us a telos, a trajectory uh, for this kind of, of work. And, and the spiritual resources we must marshal to, uh, to really persevere and make progress. Thank you. That's a very, very uh, hopeful outlook. And Hira, what gives you hope in this type of work? Well, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, um, the, the um, you know, ch church faces lots of problems and, and uh, histor historically, you know, there are lots of unresolved issues um, in the church. But um, the church also um, offers lots of uh, specific techniques, techniques for, for um, reaching um, a good decision in a difficult um, um, 
situation and uh, the individual and also kind of um, collective kind of discernment processes and techniques um, there are the church has to offer um, um, for for that um, have been um, really and really productive for me personally and in fact that uh, I was really energized uh, in a uh, um, uh, when I participated in a spiritual reality, a spiritual retreat um, at the Jesuit uh, um, retreat center where Father Rupe used to uh, based um, a couple of years ago, and um, um, so um, you know, like I think one step at a time, but one person at a time. We need to persuade, and we need to also co continue to uh, de relate, um, uh, and, and one person at a time to to another person. And so that's really the vision of peace, I, I think, um, the, the Pope uh, offers. Um, and, and that's the only way we can build peace from the bottom up. And, um, and, uh, and that's really the, also the message um, the church has to offer. And, and um, um, so I, I don't want to kind of give up on the, the hope of um, um, reaching Reaching uh, the 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 space where we do not need um, uh, weapons uh, at all, and 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 we need to have that kind of radical hope um, for for the next generation. Thank you, thank you both for the work that you do and for uh, your sharing with us tonight. Now we move to our breakout sessions, in which we'll ask folks to consider what the role that churches can play. What are the roles that churches can play in nuclear disarmament and arms control? Uh, and which of these things was most resonant to you, uh, uh, what your ideas are on this. And then we'll ask one from person from each group to report out when we gather back together. So uh, thank you, Annie, for putting us into our breakout sessions at this time. And now it's time to hear from our group. So what some of your uh, main points of discussions were of, of what you thought some of the key points were for the church's role in, this, in these issues. Uh, and so let's hear first from group one, who is our uh, our report out person from group one. I'm not sure we uh, designated one, um, but I, just to dive in, I think um, we covered some contours around uh, uh, questions around how to um, develop new kind of organic movements, um, you know, and, and interests in respective countries. Uh, the unique challenges of um, trying to engage civil society in, in countries where the, the church is not present um, uh, and, and otherwise could have, you know, other types of difficulties in, you know, generating these kinds of dialogues. Um, those were a few, uh, I think, key, key themes and uh, features uh, in, in that regard. Um, so I was also kind of developing kind of ethical, working on how do we develop ethical frameworks and perhaps, you know, scholar resources so that that could be then fed into some of those forms in which uh, uh, we find ourselves, um, you know, while also recognizing, um, you know, the Catholic Church does remain an, an important um, convening uh, agency, certainly on a kind of global level, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the Holy See at the Vatican itself. Excellent. Well, thank you, Lucas. So how to sure. develop new organic movements and how to develop ethical frameworks and the, the church does play a role. Peter, you want to jump in on that? I think you would need to unmute. <laughs> Annie, can you unmute Peter? Yes, one moment, Maria. Peter Metz. You're muted, Peter. Annie, can you unmute Peter? <laughs> there we, there go. we go. Terrific. Finally, Thank you. Um, Annie and I were fighting one another for control. <laughs> the, um, um, I, I'm sorry, I guess I was in group one and, and I was the designated reporter, but I didn't realize it was group one. The um, We talked about um, how little the bishops work on nuclear war and nuclear weapons issues is known. It's behind the scenes. It's not uh, known by the, uh, their devotion to this topic is not shared by the, um, by the, um, by the, by the people in the pews. Um, 
we also um, brought up the idea that we need to mobilize Catholic lay people. I think there was a general recognition that if we don't mobilize a lot of people on this issue, it's not going to, nothing is going to happen. Um, so a big question is how do we get to the parish and how do we mobilize people? Um, and then there was um, the issue that about how the bishops in the various nations who are concerned about this could collaborate internationally. Uh, they're set up for doing that. Um, and maybe we need to facilitate it. Excellent. Well, thank you, Peter. And now uh, we have from group two, uh, who is our report out from, from group two? I think it was Francine. Um, so we covered a few different topics. Um, one thing that particularly stood out to me was the role of the Catholic Church in um, nations where Catholicism is a minority nation, or not nation, sorry, religion. Um, and so one thing that I, I learned, I guess, was how um, ecumenical work is so important, especially when it comes to the nuclear question, because a lot of religious institutions will agree um, about at least the ultimate end goal or on ways to get to the end goal of complete, complete disarmament. Um, and so I thought it was really interesting that in countries like Japan, for example, um, that is one creative pathway um, to bring greater peace. Um, and then another um, thing we discussed was um, kind of the unique situation in Japan with how because of their history with nuclear weapons and energy, um, education and even other pathways that the Catholic Church might have been able to use to educate Japanese on the issue and on the Catholic perspective might not really be feasible. So yeah, overall, I just thought that kind of the unique situation um, in Japan is super interesting because I think um, while some doors are closed for um, educating people, for example, on the nuclear issue or working towards worldwide disarmament, well, some doors are closed. It's also kind of an open door for creative solutions. Excellent point. So thank you, Francine, and uh, pointing out the differences that the church faces in different areas of the world, whether it's a majority religion in some countries and minority religion in others. And that may lead uh, in some countries to need to be much more creative in their, in their ways of, of accessing and working with others. So great points. How about from group number three, who is representing the team for group three? We had some really great questions raised here on the role of the church in, in various parts of the world. Uh, and some of the, the, the common concerns of, of how to mobilize uh, people in the pews, uh, how to mobilize organic movements, uh, that the bishops alone are not the church. Uh, that the, while the activities of the church leadership is certainly important, it's also important to utilize uh, all the different elements of the church. Uh, before I turn it over to George to talk about um, our, our, our poll here and our, and our, um, our uh, uh, give us an outline for tomorrow, I just want to share one thing was raised in our group, and that was uh, the importance of Catholic educational institutions and how that may have an outsized uh, influence beyond the, the, the role, uh, beyond the church itself, because obviously people from many different backgrounds will uh, attend Catholic educational institutions. And I'll just give you two quick anecdotes. One, uh, when I was in Ghana, where the church is a minority, the Catholic church is a minority, uh, I had um, many different people tell me uh, unsolicited that uh, Catholic uh, uh, educational institutions were, were a melting pot where people from various religions came together. And it, they said it really helped uh, uh, Muslim Christian relations in the country because they had built bonds together as classmates in school. And so when extremist group came in and tried to inflame things or uh, undermine uh, people of one uh, identity group, uh, people from the other identity group would say, no, we know that person, we, we have relationships with them, and we're able to kind of uh, de-escalate and put out fires because of those personal relationships built. Um, the second is the time I was uh, in, in, in Ireland, 
and some uh, 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 violence had broken out. And I was just happened to be listening to um, the uh, radio and, a, and a, a, a parliamentarian was speaking who was known for being very secular, not related to, uh, not a religious person. But I was struck by his, uh, uh, his discussion could have been Lucas from the USCCB giving uh, a discussion on an issue area from all the points that the ethical points of the Catholic Church. So there can be that, that spillover effect uh, from people uh, who go through educational institutions. They may not be part of the, uh, of the spiritual organization, the religious organization, but still may come away with an appreciation uh, for, for church teaching uh, and bring that into their uh, other aspects of their lives. So I think that was a, an interesting point that was raised in our group. But back over to you, George, to tell us a little bit about the, the polls and a, a preview for tomorrow. Thanks everybody for a very robust and excellent discussion. Yeah, and thanks Marianne for all you did tonight to uh, stimulate that discussion and be part of it. Uh, very, very thankful to our all of our guests this evening. Um, both uh, Mike at the start and uh, our good colleagues, Hero and Lucas. We got a lot of good feedback from the polls about how much people learned that uh, they had not learned before. And it was just good for us to get a sense of where the group has been on some issues. And so we, we benefit tremendously from the kinds of things, Lucas and Hero, you, you brought to us. Thanks so much. Um, tomorrow night, it's hard to believe, it's our last night together. But as promised, we wanted to continue to bring forward to you some of the important organizations. Uh, we had talked about Catholic approaches and churches today, but tomorrow we visit with Kelsey Davenport of the Arms Control Association. And uh, I won't say it in her presence because she'll yell at me and uh, say, don't do that. Kelsey is probably the most prominent non-governmental voice in Washington for holding government official, officials count, accountable to the real facts. And I don't mean just in the Trump administration, I mean even in the Obama administration beforehand. Uh, there are ways that I think if she chose the governmental route rather than non-governmental, she's someone who would be quite high up in the State Department, particularly in charge of arms control and disarmament issues. She is deeply knowledgeable incredibly effective in terms of advocacy. We'll also have a panel uh, of young people, in some cases just barely older than you, and in some cases younger than some of you, uh, who've joined us these past couple of nights who are working in this area. And uh, I, I thought it was great when our NTI colleagues last night shared a bit about their route and didn't think that was going to be their route. Uh, for I think it's fair to say each of these three women who will join us tomorrow night about the career panels and how you find a way through. They have three different journeys, but it's also pretty clear that they were inspired by things to go into action in this field and found a way. So it's gonna be a very exciting night for us in our closing night. Um, and again, we're just delighted to see so many of you staying with us through the whole week. And, and we look forward to bringing it to a close with you in a, in a good action way tomorrow. <laughs>